Okay. Okay. Hello, everyone. Hello. Here we are. Another Thursday. Check, check. Check, check. Anyone streaming? Anyone on? We'll start in a minute. Check, check. Okay. Excellent. Can you hear? How's the voice? Voice works. Okay. Okay, now we all need to obey. That actually may be part of it today. Good, okay. So, connection is good. Uh, voice sounds good. Uh, okay, both clear. We'll start in two minutes. Uh, today's going to be, today's one of my absolute favorite topics. Nice. Nice. What's that crown? I still haven't figured out what that crown icon is next to next to the chat's name. I still don't know. I thought that I thought that uh, that emote would ban. I don't know. Oh, got one more minute. Oh, okay. So got got it. Got it. Got it. Got it. So Twitch Prime, which. I used to have a long time ago, but I don't. Um, I, I don't. Um, one of the things that uh, you may find very peculiar with the screen right now is, yeah, that's actually my other contact information. It, it's real. And that's how I'm going to start off today, is I'm going to actually start off uh, with some motivation and some, uh, just a backstory. Uh, why this is one of my favorite topics. Uh, of the whole uh, introduction to security class. Okay, here we are. It is now 4.30 p.m. Eastern Time. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome. Uh, introduction to cybersecurity. I'm Ming Chao, Associate Teaching Professor at Tufts University. Um, today, I'm going to take my hat off. And I'm not going to be wearing the Tufts hat today uh, because I'm going to wear uh, another hat, and I wear many, many different hats. Some of you may actually know that I have a lot of roles, jobs outside of Tufts. And today is uh, going to be the day where I talk about um, what I do outside of Tufts. And a little motivation uh, why this is arguably my favorite topic in the whole introduction to security course. And what today we're going to do packet analysis using Wireshark. So that's actually my real contact information on, on the screen. And I want to start off and talk about what I do outside of Tufts, um, especially during the summers. And you may be wondering, what is this thing called the, the Wall of Sheep? And also the Packet Hacking Village at the DEF CON Security Conference. The DEF CON Security Conference is one of the largest, if not the largest, uh, cybersecurity and hacking conferences in the world. Uh, each and every summer is held in Las Vegas, uh, beautiful Las Vegas, Nevada, uh, in the summers. And, you know, the last in-person DEF CON conference in 2019 had, it was like over 30, like close to 30, if not over 30,000 attendees. And part of DEF CON is, um, it's a, uh, place for people to gather and learn and there is a village at DEF CON called the Packet Hacking Village where our mission is on security awareness okay and we accomplish a security awareness by doing interactive demos uh, hands-on workshops uh, talks uh, and other unconventional methods, including um, including a phone jack booth one time. You know, what happens if you plug your phone into an untrusted charger? And then it spits up something on your screen. The Packet Hacking Village um, is infamously is also known as the Wall of Sheep. A lot of people call it the Wall of Sheep area. Um, that's the name of the security team. And we're all volunteers. But the security, but the wall of sheep goes back a long, long time. And if anyone ever goes to DEF CON, um, this is 
probably one of the most telling scenes and um, event, uh, parts of the conference. This is the infamous wall of sheep. So what we do, what we've done for years, I mean, well over 15 years, and this was how I got my career started in, in cybersecurity, was we have access to the entire DEF CON conference network. And we monitor the entire network for anyone who is using websites, services, uh, that sends username and passwords um, in plain text to illustrate the dangers of sending sensitive information such as username and password on an insecure network or if you're not using encrypted services. So here is a picture of a wallet. This was from a few years ago. And we have a team of volunteers that monitors the conference network, also known as the world's most dangerous network because DEF CON attracts uh, all, types of, all types of hackers and attackers. Um, the good, the bad, lawyers, law enforcement, criminals, um, journalists, you name it. Uh, military folks, many descend into DEF CON and go on the network. And it is w arguably the one of the world's most dangerous networks. Anything goes. And we monitor the network for anyone who's sending username and passwords, uh, quote unquote, in the clear, unencrypted, unsecurely. And what we do is, if we find an account, a username and password being sent insecurely on the DEF CON network, we will make a wall. We will actually make a note of the username, as you can see in this picture in the login column. The password, first three characters only and everything else blocked off, censored out. The domain or the IP address that use that credential, that username and password is used. And the application or protocol that's being used to send that username and password insecurely. For example, if you're using uh, unencrypted, insecure protocols and applications such as HTTP, POP3 for email, FTP, um, we're going to find it. And what this serves, this wall serves is, it feels like a wall of shame. It feels like a wall of shame, but... It is an educational mechanism to show people, okay, we caught you, but hopefully this is a learning opportunity to show you that we got your username and password, but in the future use more secure or encrypted services such as HTTPS. Instead of using HTTP, you send your credentials over HTTPS. Which, by and large, a lot of most webs, a lot of the important websites use now. Okay. So, how do we actually build this wall of sheep? How do we actually capture and rip out all the usernames and passwords? And we, what we do is a technique called packet analysis. So in short, what packet analysis is really just looking and understanding at network traffic. Packet analysis is used, is goes by a number of different terms and names such as network traffic analysis, packet sniffing, protocol analysis, packet tracing. They're all the same. Okay. So why? Why packet analysis? Packet analysis, like a lot of things in cybersecurity, can be used for both good and bad. Uh, packet analysis has been around for a long, long time. And it is used for troubleshooting, uh, diagnostics, um, recording uh, communications uh, for record keeping purposes, analyzing web traffic, reconstructing uh, pictures, movies that are transmitted over a network, 
Um, and of course, as I just said earlier, to catch any usernames and password personal information that was sent all over a network insecurely in plain text, which is really, really bad. Packet analysis, again, can be used for both good and bad. Um, so this was from a few years ago. Uh, this was in Wired Magazine uh, when Mirai, uh, there was a, an article on Mirai. And this was this really great article by um, Garrett Graff, which um, had a little bit of interesting wording issue. And I like to tell people that we almost started World War III on Twitter. And in the article on how the Mirai botnet works, and there was this paragraph that is on compromised devices, they had to carefully reconstruct network traffic data and study how the Mirai code launched so-called packets against its targets, a little understood forensic process known as analyzing PCAP packet capture data. Think of it as the digital equivalent of testing for fingerprints or gunshot residue. It was the most complex DDoS software I've run across. Um, and it's, it's a little bit of awkward wording, but it does present a lot of important information. So one of the reasons why I show this is because, you know, packets and PCAPs are used all the time. They're mentioned all the time, especially in cybersecurity uh, literature and and, and writings. Um, but I also want to use this opportunity to, you know, go over some basic definitions. So you may be wondering, what is a packet? What is a PCAP? Uh, and what is DDoS? And we'll talk about DDoS in, uh, in the next few weeks. Um, let's start off with what is a packet? What is a single packet? Not packet, a single packet. A single packet is a, just a unit of data. So, an analogy, anything that you do over a network is comprised of many, many packets. Um, when you stream a video, when you load a web page, it's all comprised of many, many packets. Um, right now, you're on Twitch. This Twitch stream is made up of many, many packets. When you are using Netflix, okay, the video that is being streamed onto your TV screen is made up of many, many packets, many packets. But one single packet usually contains the following information. Source and destination IP addresses and port numbers, MAC addresses, time to live, the protocol that's used, uh, payload, which is the parts of the data or the movie or the song or the picture, whatever. And a single network packet encapsulates all layers of the what is called the Open Systems Interconnection Model, better known as the OSI model. So what is the OSI model? In short, what the OSI model is, quote, a conceptual framework that describes the functions of a network or networking or telecommunication system. There's seven layers. So what it is, you know, in short is there are seven layers with the highest level of abstraction at the top, all the things that you know and love to layer one, the things that you don't usually think about, but really how that's really important for not only how your information gets transmitted from computer A, from, from point A to point B, but also um, how networks really work. So at the very top layer, think about the stuff that you all know and love, such as um, email, web, uh, streaming video, chat. That's on the application layer. And then at the very bottom, you know, you have like hubs, cables, wire, uh, electron, you name it. Okay. In the middle, in the middle, there are, you know, layers. There's a presentation and session layers. But the two important ones that we're going to use all the time, we talk about in this class all the time, are the transport layer and the network layer. Um, the network layer, um, is where the idea of the internet protocol lies. Internet protocol will only give you two, uh, give you a couple important pieces of information, namely source and uh, source IP address and destination IP address. The transfer pro transport protocol is where TCP, the transmission control protocol, lives. This protocol has information such as port numbers and bits of the payload. 
So transmission control protocol and the inter and the internet protocol works together. And you put them together, you will have source uh, source IP address, destination IP address, port number, payload. Um, you also have like um, control bits. So the whole thing, you know, is why they call it TCP IP. Transmission Control Protocol plus Internet Protocol. So wait a minute, this is a conceptual model. So how do you actually see this, you know, on a screen or for to, to analyze? Well, before we get to, to that, let's talk about what a PCAP file is. A PCAP file is what is called a packet capture file. PCAP stands for packet capture. Dot PCAP. It's a file that contains many, many network packets. And it's commonly used in, you know, many applications. You can open up PCAP files and tools such as Wireshark, EaterCap, BetterCap, um, Cane Enable, list goes on. On and on and on. Many different tools. A, just to give you a low idea, a 100 megabyte PCAP file can contain tens and tens of thousands of network packets. So, what is this Wireshark thing? For Wireshark, what it is, is just a graphical and extensive packet analyzer. Free and open source, platform independent. Um, you can do so much with it. Uh, so much with Wireshark. Download it at wireshark.org. And so how do you use Wireshark? So what we're going to do next is we're actually going to get to a hands-on and we're going to analyze a number of different packets. The Wireshark interface will look like this. It seems daunting, but there's going to be one, two, three, four, four important panels. Uh, one is the main toolbar. This is where you can actually do things like uh, search for text. Um, you can even do filtering as well, too. The second panel with all the columns, with uh, as you can see in the green and black, this is where it is a packet list pane. This will actually show you the important base, uh, bits of information about uh, a packet. One single row is one packet. One row is one packet. Um, when you select a packet on the packet pane, on the packet list pane, you will see on the packet details list the breakdown of the packet. In other words, all the layers of the OSI model. You will see, okay, the source and destination IP address in the internet protocol. You will also see the port number, destination port numbers, um, TCP flags, and even payload data on the transmission control protocol layer. Uh, and the last panel is in just really nice is the uh, packet byte pane, where you actually can see the actual raw packet in binary format. When you hover over something, such as, for example, source IP address in the packet details pane, you will actually see where that piece of information is on the packet bytes pane and the real binary data. So, for example, if I actually hover over or select the source IP address, you'll actually see where the bytes are in the actually pipe packet bytes pane. So now I can get out of this. I don't need to show this slide anymore. Let's have some fun. Don't need preview anymore. Oh, by the way, here's a uh, here is the tweet uh, stream uh, between myself and Garrett Graff, who's the author of that Wired article. I want to give a shout out to Garrett. Thank you so much for being good sport. Um, and also, thank you for that article, which, of course, I'm using, I've been using uh, for teaching purposes. So, there it is. It's where a unit of network traffic data is confirmed. Okay, I already done all that. So, I'm going to open up a terminal and go to my desktop. And I'm going to download, using wget, a very simple PCAP file. HTTP colon slash slash www.cs.tufts.edu slash comp slash 116 slash simple dot pcap. And I'm going to download this pcap file. It's a very small pcap file onto my desktop. There we go. 715 kilobytes. Or 4 kilobytes on disk. Now, if I actually try to look at this PCAP file on the terminal, you're going to see it's a binary file, see it anyway. 
you're going to see binary data. It's very small, and that's it. Not very helpful. Not very helpful. What happened if you do a file simple.pcap? Ah, the file command shows that it's a pcap capture file version 2.4. Okay, nice. All right. So you know that a pcap file is largely binary. Hardly you can't see much on a terminal screen. But let me open up Wireshark now. Wireshark. Here it is. First thing you're going to see, you're going to see a whole bunch of network interfaces that you can use. But in this case, we're not going to do any of that. We're going to do a file. Open. Simple.pcap. I'm going to open this up. And here you go. I opened up this very small simple.pcap file. Now for diagnostic purposes, can anyone, can everyone can chime in? Can, can you see the, uh, peak, uh, the screen on Wireshark? Can you see the screen? Please chime in. Let me enlarge this set for a second. Okay, excellent, excellent. So here it is. This is a simple PCAP file. It only contains one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight packets, eight network packets. You can only see, you can also notice there's a source IP address, the destination IP address, the protocol column, and information info, which is so, like a snapshot of like important information such as port numbers, source port to destination port. You can even see the TCP flags. Okay, let me just hover like go to the first packet, and you can see the breakdown of the packet here and the packet list and, and the detailed pane. The frame, if you if you click on frame, it's just the entire packet. You see Ethernet too which is layer two on the OSI model. You can see the MAC addresses. And MAC addresses, you know, one thing that, Mac, um, that you can do with MAC addresses, you can deduce the, uh, the manufacturer of a hardware. MAC address is a hardware address. So notice, if I click on the, uh, the destination MAC address under Ethernet 2, you can see where the destination MAC address is um, on the actual bytes of the raw packet source MAC address. Okay, let's go to layer three, the internet protocol. The internet protocol will have a whole bunch of different flags, total length, there you go, identification, flags, the protocol. Notice that when I actually click on the protocol under I internet protocol, you can see the Z S06, you can see where it is on the actual raw binary byte. Source address, and you can see it being highlighted in the raw packet. Destination IP address. <laughs> I'm seeing the chat right now. And I'm noticing a question that says, why if it is not encrypted? Okay, am I correct? Here's the questions on, on Twitch. Am I correct that the payload is the content of the message? Oh, yes. Yeah, if, if so, can you use Wireshark to interpret the message? Of course, of course, absolutely. Or if it is not encrypted. Absolutely, the great question. Am I correct that the payload is the content of the message? Yes, you are correct. If so, can you use Wireshark to interpret the message? Yes. But the caveat is if the communications is not encrypted. If my computer sends a packet to a server on the internet and I intercept it on my own network, will the destination MAC address uh, be that of my router or that of the remote server? Um, if you are sending a packet to a server on the internet and you are, the, the destination MAC address should be the Actually, the destination MAC address should be the MAC address of the remote server, while the source MAC address should be that of your router. 
or your virtual machine that you're using or whatever um, or whatever is, is, is doing the sending of the packet to the server. That's a great question too. So hopefully that answers your question. Um, again, if you are sending uh, a packet to a server on the internet and you intercept it on your own network, um, the, the destination MAC address should be that of the remote server. While the source MAC address should be whatever is doing the sending of the packet. Does the incognito browser mode make it harder for those to intercept your packet? No, not really. Not at all. Not at all. Not at all. Good question, though. So, I want to get back. I want to get back um, to the, am I correct that the payload, uh, you know, uh, that the payload was the content of the message. Yeah, I think I saw something in text here. Ah, here it is. Packet number four. Packet number four. You can see what me worry. You can go to transmission protocol payload. The data is always going to be found under the TCP or UDP. If you're playing like video, like online streaming of video games or, uh, or, or media. And you can see TCP payload, 15 bytes. What me worry. Okay. HTTPS, yes, does. Correct. Because HTTPS in, as, is encrypted. That encrypts your, uh, all, the, all the data, like the web page that is being sent to your computer. So now, hold on. The important question is, Earlier on, I said using packets, using, P, uh, using, you know, if you have a PCAP file, you can reconstruct a conversation. You can reconstruct something. You can reconstruct a picture or whatever got transmitted. So how you do that in Wireshark is the following. Let's do that. Click on any packet. Right-click. Follow. TCP stream. And you'll just reconstruct the conversation. In this case, you can see that the conversation between 192.168.1.3 to 192.168.1.8 is just one simple text. What? Me worry. That's it. So how you do that again is click on a packet, right-click, follow TCP stream. And you can see the entire conversation, 15 bytes. That's that. Oh, one more thing before we head out, and we actually do a real fun example. We're going to get to more complicated examples. Notice that there, and, you know, if you take a look at the packets, you can see sync, sync ACK, and ACK, the TCP three-way handshake. You can see the TCP three-way handshake between 192.168.1.3 and 192.168.1.8. Okay? So now, let's do something fun. Let's do a little more complicated example, a little more complex example. I want to close this out. I want to clear the screen. I'll go back to um, my terminal. But this time... I want to go up and I want to go and do a wget http colon slash slash www.cs.tufts.edu slash comp slash 116 slash sample2.pcap. So I'm going to have a new pcap file. I'm going to download a new pcap file called sample2.pcap. Is this what you do to get uh, people's login information for the wall of sheep? And the answer is largely yes. But I'm going to do a real example down the road. Let's do this one first. Uh, and that means that you don't have wget uh, installed on your computer. Or, I mean, you can just go to, down, go to a web browser and just point this URL and download it there. Interesting. I got a 39 megabyte PCAP file that I just downloaded. Sample2.pcap. Okay. 
Uh, in the lab, it asks about the application protocol. Does it find that? Do we find that in PK, uh, in Wireshark? Yeah, it's in the column. So yeah, we'll do one exam. We'll do one of those. Uh, I'm going to open up sample2.pcap right now, the one we just downloaded. This one is 38.59 megabytes. I can double click on the PCAP file and what do we have? Interesting. So the protocol is going to be TCP in this case. Hey Chris, how are ya? Before you can keep on getting, is there any reason that they can send four packets each, each message is was only 15 bytes? Before you keep uh, going on, can you say if there's any reason they keep, they send four packets? Uh, if the message was only 15 bytes. Uh, that was only, the, that was a message. 15 bytes was what's me worried. I, uh, I sent that message using, uh, using a real simple tool, but let's do this one. Let's go to look at sample2.pcap, which we just downloaded. God, what in the world is this? What in the world is this? What's going on here? Well, let's see. What do we know? We know that the protocol is TCP. It looks like we have two source and destination. We have a source and a destination IP address, and it's pretty consistent. We have a source that is 192.168.1.228. We have a destination that's 192.168.1.20. How do you uh, get W get? You know, you get W get. You have to download it onto your order onto your computer. Most computers like Kali Linux, uh, Mac OS will have it installed. Whoa! Wait a minute! Wait a minute! Whoa! 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 This PCAP set sample two. The PCAP has what? How many packets does this thing have? 38,469 packets in sample2.pcap. Yeah, sample2.pcap, the file has 38,469 packets. That's quite a lot. That's quite a lot of packets. So what in the world is this thing? Well, one thing that you can do is what we just did on sample uh, on uh, on the previous PCAP file. Click on any packet. I don't care which one you click on. I'll pick this randomly. Click on the packet. Right click. Follow TCP stream. All right. Click on a packet. Any one. Follow, right click, follow TCP stream. There we go. Watch what happens. Now notice that we don't have entire conversation built yet. It's a 37 megabyte conversation. Notice that counter of packets right here keeps growing. Now it's done. 31,582 client packet, zero server. Okay, interesting. This is the entire conversation in ASCII text. Wow. Lots of stuff here. Lots of stuff. Does this give the message contents? Yeah. So let's do this. What in the world is this thing? It's a pretty long conversation. It's a pretty long conversation. There's a lot of stuff here, but no, okay, well, now we get interesting. We have some human readable content here, such as Apple QuickTime detect face. I see Apple QuickTime detect, you know, something. All right. So let's save the, we can, what we can do for further analysis is we can save this entire conversation on disk. It's music. All right. Sage King Touch says is music. All right. Let's say let's say it's music. Are we sure about that? Maybe. Let's do a show data as ASCII. As ASCII text. And let's do a 
Save As. And we're going to save it on our desktop and we're going to call it Output. No file extension, no nothing. I'm going to do an Output. I'm going to save this entire conversation, ASCII text, as Output. I'm going to hit Save. I'm going to close. Uh, actually, let's, let me minimize the window. And notice Output got saved onto my desktop. It's a 37.3 megabyte file. It's a document. So what in the world is this thing? Why isn't there a file extension? I'm putting no file extension for a reason. All right, I don't want to make any assumptions. I don't want to put a, a, a file extension because what we're going to do next to answer your question is we're going to use the file command to determine the file extension. File output. It's a good question. Why isn't there a file extension? I don't want to make any guesses yet. I want to use a file command to determine what kind of a file is this. Ooh, file output. It is a Apple QuickTime Movie. MOV. If you save it with the file extension, does it modify the content? Let's do that. So let's do, there is a nice little quick command line that you can do to actually rename a file with a proper file extension called move mv. Let's move output. And let's now add a file extension. Output.mov. Let's do it. You ready? FaceTime video is your bet. Is it? Maybe. Are you ready? So I'm going to rename output what I saved from Wireshark to output.mov with a proper file extension because that's the output of the file command. Boom. So I'm not going to open it now and oh yeah the document output.move could not be opened. The file isn't compatible with QuickTime player. Interesting. Well, I can tell you what's wrong. I can tell you what is wrong. We save. I'm going to quit. I'm going to actually hit OK. But I'm going to trash this again. Actually, before I trash, I want to do a more output.mov. It turns out that you don't want to save the contents to be ASCII text, which you're seeing on the screen here. You don't want to do that. We got one step wrong in Wireshark, and this is why I, I did this deliberately. I want to go back to Wireshark. Unless you're so sure as ASCII text, if it is a file most file, most, most content, pictures, movies, you don't want to show the data as ASCII. You don't want to show and save it as ASCII. You want to show the data as raw, binary, raw. You want to save the content, save the content as raw, binary content. Also, let the whole conversation build. You can see the counter being counting up. If you save it with an extension, then does the computer try... Whoa, 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 whoa. If you save with an extension, then does the computer try using a different application to use the file, but then confuse when it doesn't know... Yep. Uh-huh. It's a good question. This time, let's do this. Okay, I got it. The whole conversation is now built. 37 megabytes. This time, we're not going to use... This time, we are not going to actually uh, save it with save this thing as, uh, without an extension. We're going to cheat a little bit. This time, make sure that the whole conversation is built. 37 megabytes. Show data as raw. Not ASCII. Save as... Save to my desktop. Now this time I'm going to put output 
I could do this again. I could do the file command again and, you know, the trying to determine. But we already kind of know that. We already did it earlier. Got MOV. Watch what happens. I'm going to save uh, as output.mov. Save it to my desktop. This time, when you open it up, QuickTime Play opens up. Yeah, so the biggest change that we had to do, we had to save the file as non-ASCII, but binary. And if you're curious what this video is, um, this was at the Paris Hotel and Casino in August of 2019. Uh, we crashed a party um, of a friend. She wasn't happy with us, but we stayed anyway. And then, of course, the party cleared out. And they had dueling piano at the Paris Hotel. And I, uh, I'll never forget, um, it was myself, Peter Keenan, who's a CISO of Lazard, and my buddy Josh Abraham. All three of us were hanging out at the bar. And we saw a dueling piano and we saw this. And I want to give a shout out to Peter. want to give a shout out to Josh. Um, great times. And uh, hopefully soon we'll, we'll, we'll go to the bar again. Yeah, good times. Uh, there was a question which was, how does the file command determine what kind of file it is? Yeah, good question. It's a very good question. That's how the file command actually works. That's what the whole point of file command is, is um, to determine uh, the, the file type of the file that you feed in yeah all right let's do another pcap set I'm gonna go download wget you can use curl www.cs.tuff.edu slash comp slash 116 slash sample 3.pcap if you're taking an introduction to security at Tufts um, this sample dot three sample 3.pcap is very similar to the uh, set one dot pcap there we go sample three dot pcap what in the world is this sample three dot pcap this one is small 391 kilobytes 400 kilobytes what in the world is this close this out Let's open up sample 3.pcap. See what it is. Yeah, sample 3. For this Twitch stream only. And it's available for everyone in the world to follow along. Sample 3.pcap. What in the world is this? Ooh, interesting. Now this time is now now this time how many packets are here? Oh. By the way, make sure that uh, your filter is cleared. Make sure the filter is clear. You can click on an X here. And this PCAP set, this PCAP file has 482 packets. Okay. What could this be? Well, there's a couple of things here. One, you see a protocol is TCP. But you then you also see FTP as well, the file transfer pro, the file transfer protocol, source and destination IP. You know, very consistent. 192.168.1.228 is the source IP. Destination is 192.168.1.8. So again, the file. HTTP colon slash slash HTTP uh, colon slash slash www.cs.tufts.edu Hold on. Let me copy this. 
I'm going to send this in the chat. There you go. That. Interesting. What in the world is this thing? What's going on here? Well, what you want to do is the following. Like what we did in the, in the last couple of PCAP sets. Right click on a packet, any packet. Follow TCP stream. To build the conversation. All the conversations that are happening in this PCAP file. Ooh, interesting. So let's see what's going on here. I see the shrieking shack. I see a username. I see a pass password. This PCAP set is actually what it is, is um, someone connecting to an FTP, a file transfer protocol server, an FTP server. In other words, in a more simple term, someone is transmitting a couple of files to a server by way of the file transfer protocol which is notoriously insecure because all the information is transmitted in plain text or unencrypted or unencrypted. Here, you can actually see username, password, some commands, but then you see store JPEG, store JPEG, some TXT file, another JPEG, Another JPEG. Okay, I got five files there. Is there a way that we can reconstruct all the five files that got sent by way of FTP to the server? And the answer is yes. The answer is yes. The entire conversation is 925 for 925 bytes. One thing is, if you want to see all the different pieces of this conversation stream, you can click on the up arrow here. Right now it's at stream zero, which means stream, think of stream zero as the first part of the conversation, which is all the commands and uh, username and password that got sent. So do you not recommend FTP? Oh no, FTP is unencrypted. So the answer is, do you not recommend using FTP? I do not recommend using FTP. FTP, as, 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 as Jasmine, Jasmine knows, knows, FTP is unencrypted, SCP would be better. SCP is secure copy. There are six total streams. There are all six. These, what it means by is that there are six important pieces as part of this conversation. Let's click up. Stream 1. Ooh, we got some data here. Stream 2. Ooh, more data. Oh, interesting. You see JFIF, Adobe, Photoshop, something, something. Sounds like a picture here of some sort. Stream 3. Ah, stream three, you get a t long text file. Cybersecurity as real politics, Dan Gear. Mm. And that, that is the text. That's a lot of text here. Mm. That's a long text file. You can probably save this as a. Okay. Hold on. We moved the video to trash. I can probably save this as Dan underscore gear dot txt. Save it to my desktop. Can I use a file like Visual Studio Code and open the text file? Oh yeah, there you go. For your interest, this was Dan Gere's uh, keynote speech at, for the Black Hat 2014 conference. Oh, yeah, you got the full text. Stream 4. 
more data. JFIF again, EXIF. Stream 5, well, yeah, you get JFIF again. Let's go all the way back. Stream 0. This is a whole log. This is a log of everything that got sent to the uh, FTP server. You also see username and password here. Woodworm and Baby Shark. Woodworm is the username. Baby Shark is the password. All right, this one. JFIF. This JFIF file. Whatever this is. Remember what we did the last time? We're not going to show ASCII. But we're going to actually show it as raw. And we're going to do a file save as. And we're going to say output 1. I'm going to save this as output 1. No file extension. Save it to the desktop. Because we're going to actually determine what the file extension is uh, a little bit later. So let's create the ASCII again. All right, this one. This one we need to save as raw. Show the data as raw. Save as. or say output 2. Save it to the desktop. Okay. Let's go to the third stream. I think this was the ASCII text that we just downloaded earlier. Yep, we don't need to save this one again where we did. Let's go to stream four. JFIF. Show it raw. Save as. Output three. And one last one, stream number five. We'll also save as uh, output four. No file extension. Now we've got four, one, two, three, four outputs. I'm going to close this. Uh, let's close uh, the PCAP set. Get out of here. Uh, we, all, we may not need this again. So I'm on my desktop. I have output 1, output 2, output 3, output 4. Let's do a file, output 1. Output 1. Output 1. Looking like a JFI. Looking like a JPEG. Oh, yeah. Output 1 is a JPEG. So let's me rename output1 to output1.jpg. So I'm going to rename output1 and rename it, out, rename the file output1 to output1.jpg with a proper file extension and watch what happens. Boom. File output2. Also a JPEG. I'm going to rename the file output2. To output 2.jpg. Look like we got out uh, JPEG data again. Rename output 3 to output 3.jpg. One more. The file command is great because, you know, there's sometimes some hackers would have, some attackers would like to rename a file, like a name a file with an invalid file extension to fool you. So I've seen like PDF files, or no, I'm, uh, some, I've seen uh, .exe files that were PDFs. Using a file will really uncover everything. So this is also a JPEG. Output move rename output four to output four dot jpeg. Okay, what do I got left? I can actually open up the file. There's output one. This got trained. This was one of the pictures that got transmitted in, on the FTP server. Another picture. It's another one. Heh. We love XKCD. Ah, one more. One more picture. These four pictures and Dan Gear's uh, text, keynote, uh, at Black Hat 2014, were the five content, the five files that got transmitted uh, to the FTP server. And yeah, FTP, uh, everything is sent unencrypted. Username and password is not only unencrypted, but also in plain text as well, too. Boom. 
How do you get the PCAP files? Ah, that. <clears throat> that is for another day. But if you want the short answer, the short answer is how do I record PCAP files? There's a bunch of different ways. A real dirt simple way to actually recapture PCAP files is if you go to Wire, go back to Wireshark. Let me go, let's go open up, um, I still need this. Uh, close all the images. Don't need this anymore. You've seen them all. Yeah, about how to, well, let's say get rid of all this. How do you record the PCAP? Let's go to sample 3.pcap. There is a button in Wireshark. Um, you see this arrow, this is uh, the shark fin here in Wireshark. It start capturing packets. So you can hit that button. And right now, everything is being recorded from my computer. By the way, RTMP, this is, uh, that's the, uh, if you see the 52.223, uh, shoot, we're already up to 11, 12,000, 13,000 packets. Uh, the 50, I'm going to stop the recording here. I'm going to stop it. This, the 15,000 packets I just recorded by just hitting the shark fin on Wireshark. This is actually the Twitch stream that's going on. Um, 52.223.227.7. I believe that's the IP address for Twitch. One of them. Let's double check. Who is 52.223.227.7? Not seven. So who is on the IP address? Should be Amazon. Yep, Amazon. Mm -hmm. There you go. Twitch TV. So we just recorded uh, that. What we just did? We just did a little quick uh, snippet. We just did a quick uh, recording of the packets uh, between my computer and uh, Twitch. And you can even see the uh, IP address here. Yep, Twitch. Um, yeah, you can save this to file. Uh, I'm going to save this as a PCAP file, not a PCAP NG. Save it to my desktop. 13.7 megabytes. I'm going to close that. What happens if I do a file right click, uh, follow TCP stream on this? What, what happens? I can't read anything. Twelve megabytes. Lots of garbage. Lots of gobbledygook. I, I don't know what this is. I mean, I can do a binary raw save as Twitch underscore stream. And I save that to my desktop. I don't think I'm going to be able to read anything. Clear ls. So I'm going to do a file Twitch underscore stream. See what happens when we get the file. T-E-X font, blah, 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 it doesn't know. Heh. Could you quickly repeat how you got the QuickTime file to open? It doesn't, uh, still doesn't open with a MOV extension, regardless of what I said. Sorry for missing that. Um, yeah, it also depends on whether you have a movie reader on your computer. But if you actually did a save it as a raw, if you're on Windows, do you have something that can open up an MOV file? Yeah, and also make sure you capture the whole conversation. So thank you all both for saying that. Yeah, yeah, definitely save it as raw. It takes, give, give it like a minute. Wait for a minute, you know, to rebuild the conversation on raw. If you rename uh, the Twitch file as Amazon, you open, I don't think so. It's encrypted. It should be encrypted. I'll do it anyway. Move Twitch underscore stream. Twitch underscore stream dot MOV. Open with QuickTime Player. Can't. It doesn't work. 
Okay. Yeah. So it doesn't work. Even if I just do a more, I rename the Twitch stream. Dot mov to a Twitch underscore stream. Dot mp4. Right click. If I try to even open this up in VLC, which opens up like anything. MO, like, VLC is awesome. It's platform independent, but it can open up any sort of media file. And yeah, it doesn't play. What makes a packet look suspect to you if you are in charge of monitoring a network? Yeah, uh, sure. What kind of, what, 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 what happens? Um, here, I can show you that one. Let's, let's, yeah, sure. So I'm going to answer that question, which is good. Which may, what makes a packet look suspect to you if you are in charge of monitoring a network? Yeah, sure. Uh, let's do one right now. I can do a, let me do a wget http slash, uh, colon slash slash www.cs.tuff.edu slash comp slash 116 slash sample 4 dot pcap. Save it to my desktop. Sample 4 dot pcap. There you go. This one is small. This one is only 17 kilobytes. Now this one, I can tell you what this sample.pcap is in a few bit, but you're going to see something interesting in this pcap. File open. Make sure there's no filter. So in this pcap set, there are 170 packets. 170 packet, not a lot, not, not a lot at all. But because you were asked what makes a packet look sus suspect to you if you're in charge of monitoring a network, yeah, um, one thing that, that, that is passed that Wireshark does is also, Wireshark also um, color codes. Wireshark can color code uh, packets. Off the top of my head, there's a, Color coding means anything? Yeah. The color coding does mean something. If it is green, usually it means HTTP, web traffic, unencrypted. Uh, red. Red means reset. Get out of here. Go away. Reset means RST. Go away. So those are examples of some, like, really, really suspect packets. If it's green... You got to go ahead to actually rebuild the conversation and just take a look at everything in plain text. Follow TCP stream. Now here, if I actually click on the, if I click on it, I can follow TCP stream. And you can see HTTP, the HTTP, the web headers and the web footers. Yeah, the colors in Wireshark does mean something. Usually when it is purple, I'm going to clear the filter. I got port 80 here, black. I forgot what black means. 443, if it's in purple, means it's encrypted. It's, en it's encrypted. So you probably can't make much of it. Black is interesting. I forget what black means. Green is HTTP. Red ones are always interesting as well, too. So I can give you that. So what is this PCAP file? What is sample4.pcap? Sample4.pcap actually has real credentials. Yeah, username and passwords. Set4.pcap has username and passwords. So how do we find them? Well, there's a couple of ways that we can find it. I'm going to give you a long way, which I do not recommend. But I also will give you a shortcut, which I will recommend, and which I use all the time at a place like the Wall of Sheep. I mean, one of the easy things that you can do is you can do a... Where's the magnifying glass on the toolbar? 
You're going to do a find. Click on the magnifying glass. And you see what this display filter gives a hex value. Go to uh, and you select string. Um, let's go to packet detail. And of course you can actually change it. Not, don't choose packet list, but packet detail. So you want to search the packets inside the packets. Leave it at narrow and wide. And you can search for strings like PASS. And you can find strings. Oh, I can see the string passwords. Not bad. Can I find authorization? Yeah, I found authorization. Basic. And I see a whole bunch of text, ASCII encoded text here. Uh, ASCII text here. One way to find passwords in a PCAP set is just use, you know, the packet, uh, packet detail search, by, you know, just do a string search. But that's a painful thing. I mean, you're trying to find a needle in a haystack if you do that. If you use the magnifying glass, which is find a packet or find strings, and you type in login, pass, password, so many different combinations. So it's really finding a needle in a haystack. So what do we do? I'm going to show you a shortcut to strip out username and passwords um, from a PCAP file. What I'm going to do now is, I don't want the Twitch one. I don't need the simple one. All right, I don't need sample two because that was a movie. I want to upload, I want to open, use, uh, open these two PCAP files. Um, I'm going to send these to Kali Linux. So I have a server running at home, which I can just SSH into. SCP, start up PCAP, Kali. I'll save it to my home folder. So I'm going to go into, I actually, I'm going to send these over. I sent the two PCAP files, set sample three, dot pcap and sample 4 dot pcap to Kali Linux. I'm going to search into my Kali box at home. So this is at my home only. I'm going to clear the screen. I do an ls and on the server at my house I have sample 3 dot pcap and sample 4 dot pcap which has got uploaded. There is a tool in um, in Kali Linux called EaterCap. Man EaterCap. EaterCap is like Wireshark, but it also does nefarious things such as monkey in the middle attacks. And even poisoning a network. It's a multi-purpose sniffer uh, and content. So it acts very much like a Wireshark, but it also does nefarious things. EaterCap is also free and open source. But what EaterCap can do, what EaterCap can do, if you send in a PCAP file, it can actually write, it can actually detect all the username and passwords. So if I do EaterCap minus capital T for text mode minus little r for read, and I send in sample dot sample three dot PCAP, watch what happens. It read in the PCAP file, and somewhere it will detect the username and password pair that was on this FTP server, the Woodworm and Baby Shark one that we did. Okay, I don't want to go through all this, but I want to clear the screen again, and I want to hit the up arrow, but this time what I want to see is I only want to see, I want to send it to a pipe, grep, which is for search. I only want to look for something called P-A-S-S, -S, all caps, semicolon. I want to look for the string P-A-S-S -S in the output of either cap minus capital T minus lowercase r sample 3 dot pcap. If I hit the enter key, watch what happens. I will see the FTP server IP address, the port number, the username, and the password. So it just shows it right on the screen for me. 
So if you're working with, let's say, a big PCAP file, if you're, work, if you're having like 60, 70, 90, 100,000, hundreds of thousands of packets, and you want to just find username and pa password credentials, you want to be using a tool such as EaterCap to just read all the username and password pairs sent in plain text. Okay, interesting. So now, what are the username and password in sample 4.pcap? Minus T minus R. Uh, where can you find PCAP files on the web? When, why, and by whom? Yeah, um, I can show you a few places. Uh, Wireshark, if you do Wireshark PCAP files. You can Google Wireshark PCAP samples, and they have a whole bunch of sample captures. They even have sample captures of, wire, of uh, worms and malware and all sorts of different networks. The one I like is also called Malware Traffic Analysis. Malwaretrafficanalysis.net. If you, it's on malware-traffic-analysis.net, and it's all a traffic analysis exercises to analyze PCAPs file, and they're all malicious. They're real malware samples. These are all PCAPs of real malware containing real malware samples, all available. All right, let's go back to this sample uh, on uh, EaterCap. Now, hold on for a second. I got Wireshark still open on my Mac on set 4.pcap, sample 4.pcap. What are the username and password pairs in the sample 4.pcap? Boom. It shows not one, not two, but three HTTP username and password sent in, in the clear. Plain text. I see HTTP colon slash slash uh, Okay, interesting. I have three different username and passwords. B. Rogers is the username. D. Moy is the username. A. Alzo is the username. And that's their corresponding password. All right, so we got one, two, three different username and passwords. All right, all three of them go to the wall of sheep, right? Not so fast. Not so fast. What we want to do is we want to make sure that these are actually real username and password, legitimate. They actually are work without actually entering, going to the website at www.ecs.tufts.edu colon slash under uh, tilde c greg that grades we don't want to go to the actual website punch in the username and then the password because that's going to be a crime by the computer fraud and abuse act don't do that you want to verify the legitimacy of the username and password pair in wireshark to, to, let's see if B. Rogers, D. Moyes, and A. Owsler. Let's see if these are real, legitimate username and passwords, and they're not like some fake. So one thing that you can do to verify each username, to verify a username and password, is this: make a note of the IP address. In this case, is 130.64.23.35. Go back to Wireshark. Now here there's a whole bunch of IP addresses here. So one thing that we can do is we can, what well, we do, filter. I only want to see the packets with that IP address, with the IP address 130.64.23.35. So one of the filters is, is gonna be IP.addr. That is IP.addr for IP address equals equals. Type in the IP address, which in this case, in the IP address in question is 130.64.23.35. Hit enter. So now all you're going to see are the packets with the IP address, whether it's a source or the destination, 130.64.23.35. Now to validate 
to validate a username and password credential pair to see if B Rogers they played with the, the username B B Rogers password they played with great character is a legitimate username and password. Again, do not go to the actual website because if you do that, if you punch in a username and password, it's a crime. It's a computer fraud and abuse act issue. What we do is right click on a packet, follow TCP stream, like what we did before, or HTTP stream because now we can actually, because uh, one of the things that's built into Wireshark is it can actually take a look at the application protocol, HTTP, web. Boom. Here you go. Ooh, interesting. So from this view, from this screen, from this conversation, something's if, iffy. It says 401, authorization required. But notice, read the text carefully. This server could not verify that you are authorized to access the document requested. Either you supplied the wrong credential, bad password, or the browser doesn't understand how to, supp how to supply the credentials required. Okay? So something's wrong. Something's wrong. Follow TCP stream. Interesting. I want to scroll up and down the streams. See what we got. I got a 401 authorization required. I got another 401 authorization required. It says it right in the text. Either you supply the wrong credential, bad password, or your browser credential. Okay? Finally, one more. It says, authorization required. Again, three times. That's it. So if you see this, you probably, now you should get the intuition. These three username and passwords, they don't look good to me. No. If, if these three username and passwords were legitimate, you wouldn't be seeing a 401 authorization required. You would be seeing like welcome, success, 200, or any of those things. It said bad password here. That's not good. But wait a minute. Whoa, 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 whoa. You may be wondering. But where is the text B. Rogers, D. Moise, A. Ausler? Where are they? And with their corresponding password. Where is that? I'm going to clear the, clear the screen. I'm going to clear the filter, but this time I want to do a magnifying glass. I want to do a string search for A. Ausler. I want to give a shout out to form, fantastic former student Ann Ausler. Um, yeah, this was made in 2016, and there was a joke that she was the Internet of Things expert. And, yeah, we had, let me say, we had so much banter and talk about how, you know, about Internet of Things. I'm going to do a string search for A. Ausler. Let's see where it comes up. Ooh, interesting. No packet contained that string is in the dissected display. How about B. Rogers? Aha, uh -huh. something happened. Here is the skinny. The username and password were transmitted in the clear, unencrypted, but it was encoded using something called Base64. What in the world am I talking about? What does Base64 mean? Well, let me do a search, quick search for Base64. Base64 is not an encryption method. It's not encryption. It's encoding. What Base64 is used to is for go from one format to another, namely from binary to ASCII formatted text. Remember how earlier on the stream I actually did a cat of the entire simple.pcap file and you see a whole bunch of binary screen, a binary text on your screen? That's not good. I made some funny noise. 
But if you remember, I don't know if anyone actually see that, but base 64 authorization. Have you ever seen this kind of, uh, I'll show you a picture on DuckDuckGo. Um, where is it? Come on. Base 64 authentication. If you ever see like, um, I'm trying to find one that has uh, base 64 authentication. It's like that little pop-up box that shows username and password. Ah, this, here it is, here it is, here it is. You may have seen one of these before. Base 64, this picture right here. I'm gonna open this image in a tab. Have you ever seen these pictures? Have I seen something like this before? If you had to try to go to a website and you see this like a little nice little window to ask for your name and your password. What actually happens is, if you are sending your name and your password over HTTP, you're, if you're sending your name and your password over HTTP, not HTTPS, the actual username and the name and the password is combined together and encoded in a format called Base64. Base64 is not encryption, it's encoding. You can usually detect a Base64 encoded string if it has like an equal or double equal sign at the end of it. So let's do Base64 encoding. I want to open up a calculator. There's base64encode.org. And I want to do, I want to clear the filter again. And I want to do an IP.8DDR equals equals 130.64.23.35. Follow TCP stream on it. Again, here, authorization colon space basic. Authorization colon space basic space. And you see a string here that starts with Y N, capital Y N, dot dot all the way to a double equal sign. When you see a double equal or equal uh, double equal or single equal sign at the end of a string, it usually intuition wise you to think base sixty four encoded string. If it's a base sixty four encoded string, it should give you the intuition. Just you can decode it. So I'm gonna make a I made a copy of that string. I'm gonna send it to a decoder at base sixty four decode.org paste the string here and hit decode and I get, well, I got B. Rogers colon they played with great character. All right, cool. Let's go for another one. Let's go to stream 15. Nope, 16, another one here. Capital Z, capital G1, and then it ends with another double equal sign. I wanna send this to the base 64 decoder. Paste this in decode the string and this is where it says Demois colon I'm a football genius. One more. Author basic authorization or basic author basic authorization if it's sent over HTTP it's just base 64 encoded. One more. This one should be the Ann Owsler one. The capital Y capital W single equal sign decode A Owsler ID 10T expert. Yeah. Interestingly enough, now Wireshark does. Um, let's take a look at this one for a second. Actually, Wireshark, if you click on a packet, they will actually, if you actually hover like this one, they say authorization colon basic, that Ann Alger, and you can see credentials. So Wireshark can also um, decode base64 strings right off the bat. And so in this case, um, you can actually find, if I get that now this time, if I actually find a Owsler. Our, oh, Owsler. ID 10. Expert. Ah, come on. Yep, now that works. 
search is a little fickle sometimes. So Wireshark can decode authorization, call, uh, authorization basic. What is authorization basic? Let's look at that again. The Wikipedia basic access authentication. And here it is. There's a nice Wikipedia on this. In the context of HTTP transaction, basic author access authentication is a method for which an HTTP user agent, like a web browser, provides a username and password when making a request. In basic HTTP authentication, a request containing a header field in the form of authorization colon space basic credential, where the credentials is the base 64 encoding of ID and password joined by a single colon base. Sadly, there's some website that still uses this, and then we can always rip out the username and passwords. So what did we do today? Well, shoot, we're over time. Um, we did basic packet analysis. We did one, two, three, four packets, uh, uh, PCAP sets. One that was a simple packet, uh, PCAP that was eight packets. One that contained a movie. One that contained FTP. And also one that contained a username and password sent uh, in plain uh, sent in the clear. So we did quite a bit. So where do you go from here if you want to learn more about packet analysis? Um, at the Wallace Sheep, if I go to wallacesheep.com, uh, each year at DEF CON, we hold a bunch of training and special events. Uh, one of the projects is called... What the hell is it? I can't even find it. Uh, well, sheep, news and events. Presentations and workshops. Let's see. Well, at any rate, we have Wi-Fi. Anyway, so at uh, Wall of Sheep, we have events such as Packet Detective. If you want to do intermediate, uh, let me do a search for Packet Detective. Well, here it is, Packet Detective. Uh, network Forensics Analysis. Um, this is a training. This is a, a nice training ground to get one more advanced packet. There's also a Black Badge event that we host called Capture the Packet. Um, Black Badge is Lifetime Emission at DEF CON Conference. So, Wall of Sheep offers these uh, events. And, you know, the web. There's plenty of PCAPs to learn and practice on. I mean, there's an option to rechain channel points. I went, okay, I don't know. Okay. Um, wait a minute. Uh, there aren't any. I can say number one. I don't know. What was that? So, the web got I mean, this. Tons of different. Got a Wireshark. Sample capture. GitHub also has a has a lots of PCAPs as well too. So there's also a lot of tools on GitHub that have uh, PCAPs uh, as well. PCAP tools and PCAPs to play with. So one of the reasons why we do this now, why I talk about packet analysis using Wireshark now, is because Will we be analyzing PCAPs later on this course? Yeah, expe yes, especially when it comes to malware. Uh, also, later on in the security course at Tufts, uh, you know, students in the class, they're using tools like EDUCAMP, Wireshark right now, but down the road in a few weeks, uh, students will actually have to write their own tools to rip out username and passwords. So the second lab is a packet analysis lab. So you just use tools like Wireshark and um, Wireshark and uh, EaterCap. But down the road, you'll also write your own tool to analyze PCAP files. That also includes ripping out the username and password pairs as well, too. And so that's that. So thanks for joining in today. We're way out of time. Hey, yeah. Is creating a public PCAP on a public network uh, legal? I mean, people do it all the time. People do it all the time. Um, 
I mean, I just did one right now. I mean, I even did one on my home network. I just did one by hitting the, the shark fin. Yeah. Cool. So I'm going to stop the stream now. And next week, we're going to talk about, we're going to do a reconnaissance. End map. Yeah.